Amen. Thank you, Sharon. If you ever need your self-esteem boosted just a little bit, you know what little girl you need to ask. So who am I? You're God. It's like, no, 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 no. Hey, church, it's good to be back with you. Last week, Pastor Jayton taught us well about what it means to follow Christ. Uh, you may remember just last week, if you were with us, we had seen previously, even the week before Pastor Jayton taught, where Jesus came and said, follow me. Uh, and so now, now that we are Christ followers, now that we are Christians, now that you've decided to follow Jesus, well, now what? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be? And, and Pastor Jayton taught us about how now we're a changed person, that, that God has changed us. And in, in unpacking the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes kind of showed us a short list of characteristics of a new person in Christ. Now that the old has passed away, behold, a new man has come. Well, what is your relationship with God the Father like? Because of the gospel, you've been made new. And you have a relationship now, the scripture teaches us, a, a personal relationship with the living God of the universe. And so we relate to him differently now that we are his disciple, now that we're his child. But then now, how are we supposed to relate to the rest of the world? So how are we supposed to relate to the rest of the world? Jesus said, come and follow me, and you dropped your nets, and you said, I'm all in. I'm with you. I'm with this one just right here as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. How am I supposed to handle myself in the rest of the world? Because I don't know what your personal story has been, but since the time I became a Christian, Christ didn't see fit just to pluck me up and take me immediately to heaven, did he? And he could have. He could have, every single one of us in this room that have surrendered our hearts and our souls to Jesus Christ, he could have instantly said, now come be with me in paradise. But he didn't say that. He's left us here in this world, in, in what a world we are living in. Every significant aspect of our world, I would contend with you, is decaying. Did you hear that word? It, it's fallen apart. The family, the institution of family, marriage anymore basic definitions of what does it mean to be a man or what is a woman even even definitional foundational things like that are, are falling apart uh, sadly there's terrible racism still in our land and around the world it's not an american problem it is a worldwide problem uh, our government our, our leaders seem more corrupt today than maybe they've ever been before We've seen just recently how men and women joyfully fight for a culture of death. And adult men and women and young people joyfully fight for the opportunity to take the life of an unborn baby. And don't even get me started on pop culture. Did you happen to watch the Grammys the other day? Don't even get me started. We could go on and on about this. So I think we all can nod our heads and say, yeah, the world seems to be decaying. It all seems to be falling apart. So how are we supposed to live in the midst of that, in this very world? Well, where do we turn when we ask such questions? We turn to scriptures, right? So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. And in the prior Sunday, Pastor Jayton picked up at the beginning there with the Sermon of the Mount. And I'm beginning at verse 13. Well, we'll see Jesus is continuing to speak. <clears throat> and Brooklyn just wonderfully read this to us. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Real short and plain and simple point here Jesus is making. While in this world, you as a disciple of Jesus Christ, me as a Christ follower, we are to be salt and light. And today, it's a really pretty straightforward time of teaching that we're going to engage in. We're going to look at these two different metaphors that Jesus uses, salt of the earth and light of the world, and see what does that actually mean to us, then how are we supposed to then walk out of here and live our lives? Have you heard the expression before, when you look talking about some person, especially in Texas, you love for somebody to say, you know, he's a real salt of the earth kind of guy. 
You heard that before? You maybe heard it, I guess we say it about women as well. I don't typically hear it like that. But, but men oftentimes are describing a good man, and especially in Texas, the way we describe a good man, you say, man, he's a real salt of the earth kind of guy. There's nothing wrong with describing a person like that, especially when it fits, right? When it's an accurate description. But Jesus is saying so much more in this passage than what, how we use that expression. See, in, in the Near East, in the days of Jesus, salt was used as a, both a preservative and also as a seasoning. I know I'm being Captain Obvious as I share this with you, but in the days of Christ, there were no deep freezers. There were no refrigerators. You didn't have an ice box. You had no such ability to preserve meat. So meat left exposed to the temperature, what's going to happen very quickly? It's going to begin to decay. It's going to begin to rot. It's going to begin to fall apart. Thus, the only way that in those days that you could keep meat from going bad was to generously salt it, was to literally bathe and soak and, and just consume that meat product with a ton of salt. Because salt is a wonderful preservative. It stops things from decaying or it slows things down that are decaying such that they can be good to you for an extended period of time. So salt is a wonderful preservative, but salt is also a beautiful seasoning. It brings out, and I don't fully understand this, I wish we had a chemist in the room that can explain this to us, but salt brings out flavor. Salt makes food taste better. And, and trust me on this one, church, more than two years ago, uh, like some of you here in this room, I lost my sense of taste, and I lost my sense of smell because of coronavirus. And as I stand here today, I still can't smell, and I can still barely taste. One thing, though, that I can do is I can taste if something is salty. And I'm probably crushing my blood pressure right now because I love salt more than ever before. But, but just a little bit of salt on something, that is one sense, that is one flavor that my brain registers nowadays is, is saltiness. And trust me, if, you, if you've suffered through the same thing, whether for a couple of days, a couple of months, a couple of years, you absolutely took for granted your sense of taste until you had it taken away, didn't you? Salt is a wonderful seasoning. It makes things taste better. Jesus comes in this scripture and he says, you are salt. You are salt. It is who you are to be in Christ Jesus. So as we begin to apply this a little bit, so if you are salt, if I am salt, then when we see someone's life that is falling apart, when we see someone's life that is, is absolutely crumbling and decaying, do you go in there to stop it? Is, is that what you do? Or when we see someone's life falling apart, when we see them trapped in sin and brokenness and dysfunction, do we look the other way and just leave them to their own vices? Do we take away from them the preservative and the seasoning that we could actually be and that they actually need? So that when we see brokenness, when we see sin in people around you, do we step into their circumstances to try to be something good and healthy for them, or do we run in the other direction? How do you respond to people like that? How do I respond to people like that? We don't have to look very far, do we? Some are in this very room because we're all sinners, and we've all got brokenness, and we've all got stuff that we struggle with. But also, as we leave this campus today, and my students go back to the high school hallways, and you go back to the office, you go back to your neighborhood, you go back maybe home to your family. When you see such brokenness, what do you do? Do we just hide right here in this church in our holy little huddle and kind of keep ourselves distanced from those people? I think what the scripture is saying is that if you hold yourself back, you're like salt that's lost its saltiness. Jesus asks, what good is it? You might as well be thrown underfoot and people can just trample it in that time. Have you ever thought about this before? This is not a unique illustration of mine. I don't know that I've ever had a unique thought in my life. But have you ever seen and heard the illustration of salt? Salt and meat. It is only good when what happens? When it comes into contact with meat, right? So you, you have that big chunk of venison. You've got that big chunk of beef there. And you've got a wonderful container of, of excellent salt. It does absolutely no good if it doesn't rub up against it and come into tight contact with that meat. Salt can only penetrate when it comes into contact with other people. 
And so I ask myself this week, and I'm asking you, who are you coming into contact with where you're a sweet seasoning, sweet's the wrong word, where you're a good seasoning, you're a good preservative and can help a person? Are you coming into contact with anybody that's like that? And, and I ask this question not just of our personal lives, but maybe in this town. Do we hide in our bubbles to such an extent that we're really not seasoning dripping springs? Maybe not just in our town and maybe more particularly in our neighborhood. As you think up and down your block, your street, your cul-de-sac, you're aching away from broken and hurting people. Rather, Christ calls for us to find a way to healthy, in a healthy way, to insert ourselves into such situations. Because he says, you are salt, you are a preservative, you are a seasoning. Now come into contact with my broken children, because they need you and they need the love of Jesus Christ. You are salt of the earth. The second metaphor that Jesus uses, you've seen it now, we, we've read it a couple of times. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but as was just said earlier, but on a stand, on a piece of furniture, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Here we have a different metaphor, light. And Jesus uses this to once again express, so who are we to be as his disciples? And in the scriptures, light Light is a symbol there for truth, right? We see this because uh, we see this throughout scriptures where light exposes darkness. Light reveals what is really real. Uh, light exposes lies. Light exposes reality and so that you can see accurately and really understand what is in front of you. Light also, because it is so brilliant, it also brings hope and it brings joy to people. It illuminates everything around it. Everybody in this room, we could all raise our hands. We have successfully survived the great ice storm of 2023, have we not? And many of you in this room know exactly what it's like to live in a dark house due to the recent ice storm. For some of us in the room, it might have been just a couple of hours, right? For some in this room, it might have been more than a couple of hours, but maybe even a day or more. For the really unlucky in this room, I know we have some five, six, seven days. Are we my close, Katie? And can I ask? I mean, there were multiple days strung together where you had no power and you had no light. Uh, Sharon and I were kind of lucky in this respect. It, we'd only went out, albeit several times, for but a, a couple of hours at a time. And what did we do when our power first went out? Well, in my household, in our various cabinets, there are 913 candles <laughs> that most of you have given to her at some point in time, and she never gets rid of a candle. So well, what did we all do? We, we all reached for a candle, right, as quickly as we could. And I'm a 59-year-old man. I've been around the block now a couple of times. I still, like a child, am amazed when you light one little candle in a dark room and then step back, and as your eyes finally begin to adjust, isn't it still amazing what that one little light can do in a large room full of darkness? As we were going through our little scenario, like maybe you did in our little neighborhood back here behind the high school football stadium, I'm kind of a nosy body. If my power's out, I'm hoping everybody else's power's out too, right? <laughs> Because what that means is we're all going to be calling PEC. We're all going to maybe rise to the top of the list so, so that help can come on the way. So while we were in the darkness several times, I would go step out onto the front porch and to look around. And, and, and I've got some neighbors in here, and it was dark, right? You look to your left, and you look to your right, and it was just a dark neighborhood. Nobody had any power at that time. But you know one thing that I could see? Because of where my house is located, I could see all the way across the hills and I could see one little light shining over here close to the water tower. It is still amazing to me what one light does and how it absolutely penetrates the darkness. For some of you in this room, I know that, that it's not necessarily a fun memory to think back about this ice storm. We're still trying to dig out of it. But what Jesus is saying here when he uses this, this illustration, this metaphor, is you as my disciple are to be a light in this world. So how does that happen? How does that work? And I need you to listen carefully to this. Church, listen. Jesus is the light. Jesus himself is the light. 
We are not like a sun, S-U-N. We are not stars unto ourselves. They have light in and of themselves. Rather, we are more like a lamp, and a lamp holds light. Jesus in John chapter 1 says that he is the true light that gives light to everything. He says his light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The the author John in in his gospel, John chapter 8, records Jesus saying this about himself. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, church, Jesus is truth. Jesus is light, and he makes all things then seen. He radiates beauty everywhere because that's who he is, and his glory shines throughout all of the earth. So what about you and me then? He says, you are to be light, or our light is derived from Jesus. You become the light of the world only as you are lit by Jesus, and I hope that's the right grammar there. So when you receive Jesus as your Savior, his light comes into your life, and you become light unto the world. You and I are to be salt and light when we surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So let's apply all of this now. This this isn't that difficult to understand, right? But how much harder is it to actually do and to actually be? This is a familiar passage. Our student ministry, the informal name of our very student ministry is Salt and Light. And we've got cool little t-shirts that even describe that. It's easy for Pastor Jayton to teach on that. But what does this actually look like in day-to-day life? Because salt and light stop decay and penetrate darkness, your life too should do the same thing when it comes into contact with the world. So listen to me, because of who you are in Jesus Christ, your very presence at work reveals any dishonesty, or reveals any unethical practices that people want to engage in. It it reveals uh, any sort of unethical behaviors that might be taking place. Just your very presence in work and who you are as an employee or as a boss at your job site. Students, your very presence in the classroom, you physically being there as a disciple of Jesus Christ, stops hateful talk. It stops people from continuing to bully someone else. Listen, all of us in this room, simply by being who Christ calls us to be, racist and hateful comments cease to happen in our very presence because people know you will not tolerate that as a follower of Jesus Christ. As the salt of the earth and as the light of the world, gossip stops when you walk into the group because people realize you're light and you're salt. And that's not the way Christ calls for us to live. And you're not going to tolerate that in yourself or in others. Critical, hurtful talk ceases from people that are around you because they see that it has ceased in you. You just don't talk to people like that, maybe like you once did. As you walk with Jesus, your light reveals the beauty that's all around you of what is good and what is holy and what is pure. The scripture says here, your good deeds, in the original language that it was written in Greek, the word there really is is closer to your beautiful deeds, cause people around you to want to know what is it about you. There's something different about you. You have something different than what I have. Because you are salt and light, you don't bring condemnation, and you don't bring guilt, and you don't bring a harsh, critical spirit to people. You're not a wet blanket of legalism and of judgment and of criticism, but rather you're a seasoning that brings out joy in people and happiness in people. So in the office, I'm going back to work again, salt of the earth and the light of the world, you're a calming influence in the office. In the classroom, you're actually that student that you're the glue that holds all things together. And when things are getting crazy, who does the teacher, who does the professor turn to? It's you, because they know who you are. They see that. In our neighborhoods, we are the people that other people turn to when things are falling apart. When it hits the fan, whether through ice storms, whether through marital troubles, whether through tragedies within the home, people actually think about turning to you because you're such a person of light and such a person of salt. 
maybe in your family. I know that not everybody's grown up and, and even in the current situation is in a household full of Christ followers. But you know who you are in your family, the, the, the role that you play? You're the peacemaker. And you're the one who loves unconditionally. And, and you're the one who's wise and whose words and whose responses just seems to be different from the rest of the family. Am I, are we applying this right now? Are we seeing this? How about as a church? See, Jesus is saying to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. You, you are the light of the world. But he's also talking to a group of people here. So as a church, right here in the very heart of Dripping Springs, this church is to bring peace to this community. Th this church is to demonstrate love to others outside of this campus in such a way that quite honestly, it didn't make any sense to other people. They don't fully understand why are you like this? Because you've got nothing to gain from the way you're treating us. As a church right here in the heart of Dripping Springs, as salt and, earth and light, we're, we're a group of people that bring hope and we bring healing into people's lives in such a way. Uh, as a church, we, we pray and hope that our reputation is such that we are so highly thought of, we are so highly esteemed by our neighbors and by our local leaders that they cannot imagine what life would be like without First Baptist Church Dripping Springs right here in the heart of their town. I've asked this before, church, hypothetically speaking, if we were just to go out of business, is that possible for a church to go out of business? That's a weird way of saying it. If we were to shut our doors and cease to exist as a church, would anybody other than us in this room care? Would our community care if we just closed up shop and said, that's it, we're done? You and I both absolutely pray that no, the answer is they absolutely would care because we are bringing so much salt and so much seasoning and so much preservative. We're bringing so much light to this, this community that we live in. We love people so well and we serve people so well that folks would just be mortified about the thought that First Baptist Church would close its doors and would cease to exist. So as I begin to wrap up, again, this is a pretty simple time of teaching, right? It's not terribly complicated. We are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ is what he teaches us. But listen to me carefully. To be his salt and to be his light, you must first be born again. See, the light of Christ must first come into your life. You cannot do this on your own. You'll wear yourself out, and it's never truly what the Scripture calls for. But rather, what we must do is you must confess of your sin. You must confess of how helpless and how lost you are without Jesus in your life. The scripture says we must repent from that. We must, we must see our sin for what it is and say, Lord, I need help turning and walking in a new direction because I don't want that to be who I am. We repent. We, we look at Jesus and we see how beautiful he is and how captivating he is. And as, as one of our youngsters said today, how King Jesus is the one that we want to worship. So we surrender control of our lives. And based upon the truth of God's word, and as Pastor Jayton even started last week, he will then change us from the inside out such that you really can be salt and can be light so that the way that I love people is different than the way the old clay would have loved you. And the way that we serve people is different. The way that we walk in this world is different because of who we are in Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father.